David Holtzman, the Andrew B. and Gretchen P. Jones Professor of Neurology. He's head of the Department of Neurology at Washington University, St. Louis. He's also the Charlotte and Paul Hegeman Professor of Neurology and Molecular Biology and Pharmacology. He's Associate Director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center there and Scientific Director of the HOPE Center for Neurological Disorders. So, Dave, I don't know what you do in your spare time, but we appreciate you being here uh, with us on this Friday afternoon. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks so much, Tim, um, uh, for all the kind words, and it's a pleasure for me to uh, meet with you, even if it's on just a WebEx, and tell you a little bit more about Alzheimer's disease. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page in regard to what it is we're talking about uh, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. So. Dementia, the word dementia, means a decline in memory and other cognitive abilities that is sufficient to impair social and occupational functioning. There are a lot of different diseases of the brain that cause dementia. In people over the age of 65, Alzheimer's disease, as, a, as one of the diseases that causes dementia, causes or contributes to about 70 to 75 percent of cases. There are a number of other, the other things that can cause dementia that are common are things like strokes. There's other neurodegenerative diseases you may have heard of, like Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia. Um, but Alzheimer's disease itself is, is the most common cause of dementia. The reason it's, we're also interested in it, of course, in addition to the uh, problems it causes, both in the patient and caregivers, is the, is the prevalence is so high. So at, at age 70, the prevalence is maybe about 2% of the population, but in people over the age of 85, it approaches 50% of people. And that's really staggering. Uh, right now, it's estimated just in the United States to care for patients with Alzheimer's disease is over $200 billion a year, and that number is expected to triple in the next 30 years unless we develop um, an effective cure, because most of the other common diseases of man, whether they be cancer and heart disease, we're getting much better at treating, people are living longer, and um, then the risk for this disease is just getting bigger. So what are the clinical features of Alzheimer's disease as a specific cause of dementia? Usually there's a very gradual, almost imperceptible onset to the disease and a very slow progression over one to two years where people usually start noticing that the person affected has difficulty with recent memory. That's not always the first presentation, but it's the most common. Um, as the disease progresses over the first few years, um, there's almost always some other things that occur at the same time. The most common other things are what's called executive dysfunction, which is difficulty with attention and problem solving. Then um, sometimes a little bit after that, uh, people begin to demonstrate difficulty with with word finding and language, visuospatial problems, getting lost. Um, and then as the disease progresses further along, uh, early on there's often apathy and sometimes depression. And then as the disease goes on, one can see other things like delusions, hallucinations, and sleep disruption is also a common feature. So there's two main types of Alzheimer's disease. The most common is the late onset form, which is after the age of 60. This is most of the people who develop the disease. But there's also a rare early onset form of familial Alzheimer's disease, also called dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, which is very infrequent, it's less than 1% of what we see in, the, in, the, in our referrals to hospitals or clinics. But um, these are people that have a, uh, a gene mutation that one can inherit from the father or the mother. And um, if you have them, if you inherit this, one of the genes that causes the familial form of disease, you have a 100% chance of getting the disease, usually at a very early age, an average age, say, of 40 to 50 years old. And the reason that this uh, type of disease has been important is it's instructed us about the pathophysiology of the disease. The two strongest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease are age and family history, which is basically genetics. So uh, this image that I now show is a cartoon version of a microscopic image of what you see in the brain of somebody who's developing Alzheimer's disease. So what you see on the left part of the screen is a nerve cell body which contains um, 
uh, material in it that's in blue. And um, what this material is is a normal protein in all of our nerve cells called tau. But in Alzheimer's disease, this protein clumps together and, and becomes very sticky. And when it does this, the, the, um, it leads to damage to the cell body of the nerve cell, as well as what's extending out from the nerve cell, which are the connections, are the, the axons and dendrites which connect one cell to another. What you also see in Alzheimer's disease is shown in red, which is the accumulation outside of cells of this protein called amyloid beta. This is a normally produced protein. It's in all of our bodies all the time. But what happens in Alzheimer's disease, normally it's made and cleared away. But in, the, in this disease, if you make too much of it or you clear it, don't clear it properly, it also accumulates. And when it accumulates, it, it wreaks havoc as well, not only exacerbating those, the tau-mediated change that you can see in the cells, but it also elicits an inflammatory response, which I'll talk more about. And so it's these two main proteins, amyloid beta and tau, that appear to be fundamental in causing the disease. It looks like amyloid beta occurs first and that it builds up in the brain over years, and then later this tau protein clumps up in nerve cells and appears to drive the actual clinical progression of the disease. I'll talk more about this in a moment. So um, this is the one, it's a little bit of a complicated slide, but I'll just take you through it. What, what I think a lot of the scientists in the Cure Alzheimer's Fund that are doing research and as a lot of the people in the field um, have been following what people call the amyloid hypothesis, which is listed here, which basically this protein called amyloid beta listed in the center um, is normally produced and cleared away, as I just said. But in this disease, it clumps together in these fibrils, and these fibrils tend to lead to toxicity to local nerve cells. They appear to elicit inflammation, and they also drive this tau protein from a soluble form that floats around to an insoluble form, which is clumped together, and, and then the tau itself leads to toxicity. The reason we think this, is, uh, this cascade is likely the case is that the early onset familial forms of Alzheimer's disease have shown us that those individuals make, produce, or make too much amyloid beta throughout their life making it much more likely that it will clump together and form these aggregates or amyloid plaques. <clears throat> what also tells us that the tau protein is important is that there's another form, another type of disease called frontotemporal dementia, where if you're unfortunate to have a mutation in this protein, it also clumps together too much, and that leads to a dementing disease. So what appears to happen in Alzheimer's disease is that the amyloid protein clumps up, it then leads to more and more accumulation of the tau protein, which leads to damage in the brain. There's a lot of missing pieces I don't show here, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. In particular, how does the inflammatory cascade in the brain impact these two processes? So one of the things that's really emerged over the last number of years is the fact that the time course of this disease is is very long. If you look at this graph, what's shown on the bottom of the graph are, uh, you could think of this as um, the natural history of somebody who develops Alzheimer's disease. So on the bottom, you can see people with very mild Alzheimer's disease. What that means is that they are clinically presenting with memory loss and other changes. If somebody dies at that point in the disease and you actually look carefully at the brain, what you can see is that the amount of amyloid plaques that I showed you in the previous slides that has built up in the brain already is already close to as much as will ever build up in that person's brain during their lifetime, and that's listed in the red bar. The amount of neurofibrillary tangles that is accumulating in parts of the brain is still on its way up, but it's already started to occur. And the amount of neuronal integrity or neuronal uh, loss that's present has already started to uh, take place in some parts of the brain. So when you first, when a person begins to develop the initial symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, that means that that person started to develop the pathology of the disease, the amyloid plaques and tangles, about 15 to 20 years before that. That may, sounds sort of um, 
ominous, but in fact, it, 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 it's actually very um, uplifting because what that means is that we should be able to detect the uh, pathology of the disease, the amyloid plaques and the tangles, years before people become clinically impaired. And that gives us a long window of opportunity if we can identify these people before they're uh, clinically impaired, we ought to be able to then institute therapies not to treat people, but to prevent the disease from ever happening. And, that, and that's some of the biggest advances that have happened recently, is we now can detect whether people have amyloid plaques and neurofibrillar tangles in the brain years and years before they become symptomatic. So if you look on this slide, this is a similar, slot, similar uh, representation, not just of a hypothetical time course of Alzheimer pathology, but this is actually data from real people that um, have early onset or familial autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease that are followed in a network called the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer Network, DIAN. This is, these are sites around the world that follow people with, who unfortunately have mutations in genes that lead them to get Alzheimer's disease 100% of the time. And because we can follow the families and we know when the parental onset of their dementia was, when we um, see individual people, we can get tests in them that determine whether they have amyloid deposition in the brain by imaging, or we can look at their spinal fluid and detect whether or not they have evidence of neurodegeneration and tau accumulation. And so what this shows is if you look at the left part of the graph, that amyloid beta or A beta deposition begins about 20 years before symptom onset. And then this accumulates and accumulates, and then by the time symptoms begin, again, as I showed you earlier, amyloid is already built up in the brain to a very high extent. You can also see that tau accumulation starts about 15 to 10 years before symptom onset. And then using very sensitive clinical means, you can actually pick up some cognitive decline about five years before when most people think people are becoming uh, memory impaired. So um, using these different tools, whether they be imaging tools or spinal fluid tools or hopefully soon to be blood-based tools, we'll be able to identify people, enroll them in trials, and, and treat them to see if we can actually delay the onset of disease. So um, what I show here is evidence of the, of the fact that if, if it turns out that you actually have these biomarkers or imaging or spinal fluid evidence of Alzheimer pathology and you start out as clinically normal, the more of these markers that you have, the more likely over a relatively short period of time you will become memory impaired. So what this shows is that our people that are listed here that are stage two and three, that means that these individuals started off as clinically normal, but they had evidence of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillar tangles in the brain. And what you can see is that over about a six-year period, that 70% of those people, or 50% or so of those people, have converted from normal to memory impaired. So this just demonstrates that these markers actually are very useful at predicting not only whether you have Alzheimer pathology, but whether you're going to become impaired in the future. And based on this type of information, trials actually have now started to identify people with Alzheimer changes that are normal and then giving them treatments or placebo to see if you can actually demonstrate whether or not a treatment will delay the onset of these symptoms. So um, a lot of news recently of the last three, four years has come out of some failed large clinical trials of some, some promising drugs. So you may have heard in the last few years that two different antibodies to amyloid beta that I was talking about earlier that were in animal models shown to improve function in the brain of mice uh, didn't have an effect in some very large clinical trials. So with both the antibody called bapanuzumab and another one called solanuzumab, these drugs uh, were entered in trials by um, uh, a number of large pharmaceutical companies and in over a thousand patient studies in people that had mild to moderate dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, there wasn't a significant effect on the main endpoints listed at the beginning of the trials. So um, this has been somewhat disappointing, to say the least, um, 
On the other hand, there's some, probably some very good reasons as to why these therapies that were already tested so far haven't had as good of an effect as we would have hoped. So I'd like to just briefly go over this because it's relevant for what we're, many of us are working on. So how do I interpret the results of these trials? Well, um, why did they fail to hit their endpoints in mild to moderate dementia due to Alzheimer's disease? So for these anti-A-beta or anti-amyloid therapies, starting the therapies in patients with moderate dementia is very likely to be too late for this approach to have a major effect. As I showed you earlier, and I'll go back uh, two slides, three slides. By the time people are clinically impaired, amyloid beta deposition at this zero time point shown here has already hit its maximal extent. And in fact, neurodegeneration marked by tau accumulation has already started. So these trials are starting probably five to six years after the onset of dementia, which is probably going to be too late to hit a target that has started accumulating 30 years before that. It also turns out that the antibody solanuzumab that was um, uh, developed by Eli Lilly, it did actually turn out to have a significant effect on slowing cognitive decline on several parameters in mild patient, mildly demented patients, but its effects were very small, uh, precluding its approval. So I think there was an indication, though, that, that there may have been something being done right that was on track. Um, one of the things that's really important to note, though, is that neither solanuzumab nor bapinuzumab at the doses that were utilized actually were shown to remove amyloid plaques from the brain to any significant extent. So that would be like saying, well, you, you didn't actually do what you thought you were going to do, so why would one think that it's going to improve uh, clinical outcome? There are additional anti-amyloid antibodies that are now being used um, and being developed that have some different properties, and I list some of them here. Cronizumab, gantanirumab, adikinumab. And some of these, and, uh, and I'll show data from one of them, has actually been shown to remove existing uh, plaques, and that's adikinumab. There's a number of other ones now that have this property. So I think um, there's a lot more excitement now about using uh, these types of agents at the right dose to really make sure you're getting rid of pathology. So um, what are the anti-amyloid beta antibodies being tested um, now in uh, both earlier in disease in the so-called preclinical phase when the pathology is starting but people don't have symptoms? There's a, there's a trial called the DIAN-TTU. This is in the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network, people that have familial forms of disease that are being treated who are still cognitively normal. And those trials, that trial is occurring now with solanizumab and gantanirumab, two antibodies, one I mentioned earlier. Um, and in addition, another uh, agent was just added to this trial, which is a base inhibitor, which is an agent that decreases the production of amyloid beta. There's a trial called the Alzheimer Prevention Initiative. This is also in a form of dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease in individuals in the country of Columbia. And this is, again, treating asymptomatic individuals before they become impaired with this antibody called cronizumab. And then there's a large trial called the A4 trial, anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. These are individuals over the age of 65 who are cognitively normal, but they are shown by an imaging test to have amyloid deposition. And this trial is also involving solanizumab, and it's been, it started several years ago. So I think there's a lot more promise now if we attack this molecule, amyloid beta, but start earlier. And just to show some of the data that's been recently published on this newer antibody called adikinumab, what is shown in this slide on the left are brain images of the accumulation shown in red of amyloid in the brain. And then on the right um, are individuals that were treated either on the top with a placebo or with different doses, increasing doses of this antibody. And what you can see is that at doses of 10 milligrams per kilogram in the lower right, that amyloid was removed from the brain of individuals treated with this antibody. Now, this was a phase 1b study, so it was a relatively small number of people. But if, you, if I show you the next slide, what it does show is if you look at a, a marker of clinical function, which is on called the CDR sum of boxes, CDRSB, you can see that with the highest doses of antibody at 10 milligrams per kilogram on the far right, uh, 
that the decline on this clinical measure was the least in people that were treated with the highest dose of the antibody. So this particular antibody has now moved into large phase three trials in very mildly impaired patients, and other companies are also evolving to move um, to this very early stage of disease with either this antibody or other agents that uh, attempt to target the amyloid beta protein. So I'm stressing over and over again that what's been going on in the field up until very recently is that people are treating patients with trying to target the amyloid protein at a time when it's probably too late. So if we go earlier in the course before people are clinically impaired, we have a much better chance whether we're targeting, I think, amyloid deposition or targeting any other aspect of the pathology of this disease, whether it be tau, as I'll talk about in a moment, or inflammation. So one of the, one of the things um, that's become clear over the last few years is that neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease um, have proteins that accumulate in the brain. And one of these proteins is tau. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease in these images of the brain is that tau appears to first accumulate in part of the brain called the medial temporal lobe, and then over time, as the disease progresses, it spreads out into other parts of the brain, illustrated on the right. And as the tau spreads to other cells in these other networks of the brain, those parts of the brain begin to dysfunction. So as it moves into the memory network, people become memory impaired. As it moves into the attentional network, attention becomes impaired. And this process of spreading is quite interesting, and it resembles what occurs in other types, another type of neurodegenerative disease called prion diseases, where proteins that aggregate or clump together tend to move from cell to cell. And um, what I think is really important about tau in relation to Alzheimer's disease is illustrated in this slide. What is shown in the middle panels in the upper panel is in red are um, areas of the brain on an MRI scan where tau is accumulating. And the people in the, who have the scans on the left part of the screen are cognitively normal. The people in the middle have, have mild cognitive impairment. They have memory loss, but not too much else is wrong. And the people on the right have more full-blown dementia, memory change, problem-solving change, behavioral change. And you can see that the more impaired they are, the more that tau has spread into other parts of the brain. So if we can somehow prevent that spreading of tau, that might be another way to uh, attack this disease therapeutically. And what this slide here shows is that the, on the x-axis or the bottom of, this, of the graph on the left is in an individual person, the more and more tau that's accumulating in the brain is the thinner or the, um, the amount of brain atrophy is much greater. So the cortical thickness is less the more tau there is. And unlike on the right panel, it shows that as amyloid accumulates, there's no correlation with amyloid buildup in the brain and cortical thickness. Again, driving home the point that while amyloid accumulation is probably bad for Alzheimer's disease, it's the accumulation of tau that's really important in killing nerve cells. So given the fact that tau spreads around the brain, one of the things that we think happens is that these, in the, in, in, these are representation of two cells. And um, the, in the blue is tau, and it appears to get out of the one cell, get into adjacent cells. And if that process is happening, then we think that molecules that can bind to the tau outside of cells can maybe block the spreading. So in the middle is an antibody to tau, and our group and others have shown that if you administer antibodies to tau to an animal model of Alzheimer's disease, you appear to be able to block this spreading phenomenon. And on the next slide, what I show you is on the left, all of this brown, brown staining in the left panel is abnormal buildup of tau in the brain of an animal model of Alzheimer's disease. And on the right is an animal that for several months was given an anti-tau antibody. And what it shows is that the antibody was able to block the accumulation of this toxic form of tau in parts of the brain that control memory and thinking. So this kind of approach has actually moved into clinical trials um, 
several companies now have, uh, I think on the next slide, no, it doesn't show it here. What I show is that what's happened is that these antibodies have now moved into human trials, both in Alzheimer's disease as well as in several other neurodegenerative diseases. So I think this is another uh, reason to be very hopeful that we're going to be closer and closer to having therapies that may delay the disease or even hopefully prevent it. So what I'm going to finally end my talk on today is some work that we've been doing in relation to the Cure Alzheimer's Fund in the last uh, two years or so. And that's um, work on a new gene variant that was linked for risk of Alzheimer's disease. So in 2013, the gene called TREM2 was associated with an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. So um, two different groups independently found that if you have a, a change in the TREM2 gene, a very small change, you're two to four-fold more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. And what's really interesting about this gene TREM2 is that it's involved in the immune system. So as I showed you earlier, in the course of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid builds up first, then later these neurofibrillary tangles build up. But what we also know from both animal and human studies is that there's an increase in inflammation in the brain that accompanies both amyloid deposition and tau accumulation. And this inflammation is mediated by a cell type in the brain called microglial cells. And what's really cool about TREM2 is that this TREM2 gene in the brain is only produced by these microglial or innate immune cells. So on the next slide, I show a diagram of the TREM2 protein. It, you can see it sticking out from a cell. So it turns out it's a receptor. And there are certain things that bind to this receptor that cause cells to signal to act in a certain way. And the mutations, which are listed in green and red in this protein that cause an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, appear to influence this signaling receptor's ability to cause the cell to function properly. And I'll illustrate that in, a, in the next slide. So this is a microscopic image on the left and on the right of an amyloid plaque, which is in the middle of the screen, which is in red. And surrounding the amyloid plaque are these microglial cells that produce TREM2, this risk variant for Alzheimer's disease. It turns out if these risk variants cause less function of the TREM2 protein. So in the right panel are, are, is another instance where we're looking at the same phenomenon, an amyloid plaque in the middle, but in this case, there's less TREM2 present, like what happens in the Alzheimer risk variant. And when that happens, these microglial cells don't respond to amyloid plaques. They don't seem to be able to mount an inflammatory response. And then if we look at the damage around these plaques, it's much greater when these cells cannot respond appropriately. So we're trying to better understand this phenomenon and, and understand if we turn on or off the normal function of TREM2, whether that actually could potentially in the future serve as a treatment. There's a lot more work we need to do on this before we get to that point, but this is, this is the idea. And in the next slide, the things we need to figure out in this area are, is the inflammatory response to amyloid that TREM2 is involved with the key part to attack as a therapeutic approach? Or is the inflammatory response that occurs to the tau protein a key thing to attack? Once we understand this, we, we could then try to turn on or off this innate immune system as a potential way to delay this pathology and ultimately the degeneration of the brain. And this is a really exciting area of the last few years, and I think it's, it's, it's ripe to uh, bring a new combination of thinking of therapies into the field of the amyloid beta and tau realm. So um, I'll just summarize and say the underlying pathology of Alzheimer's disease begins about 15 years prior to the symptoms, and it starts with amyloid beta accumulation followed by neuroinflammation and then tau aggregation. And there are now good methods to detect amyloid beta and tau pathology in the brain of a living human being, and these methods can be useful to diagnose the disease prior to symptom onset. And treatments that 
um, to decrease the accumulation of these proteins, such as amyloid beta, are very promising, especially now that the trials are moving much earlier in the time course of the disease. Treatments that decrease tau accumulation and toxicity or prevent its spreading are just beginning, but they also offer a novel way to pre potentially prevent neurodegeneration. And then finally, the innate immune system and the genes and proteins that control it, such as TREM2, do appear to be involved in the process of Alzheimer's disease. And once we know more about the brain's innate immune system, we have to be able to harness it for use in developing it as a treatment strategy. So Tim, I'll stop there, and um, I'm happy to um, answer questions from those who have been uh, listening. Well, great, Dave. Thank you. I, uh, I'm not sure you can hear the thunderous standing ovation from uh, St. Louis and all around, but that was a tremendous and succinct uh, uh, course in Alzheimer's. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. We're gathering the questions, and I want to remind people um, that they can submit a question by checking that little blue box up there in the right-hand corner with a question mark in it, and then just type your question and uh, send it back to us, and we will organize it. So I've got a question right here for you, Dave. How do I identify developing Alzheimer's pathology, A beta and or tau, now in humans? How do we detect that? Right, so the, the ways to detect it at the moment are two possible ways. One is through neuroimaging, where um, a, a, a very small molecule that binds the amyloid protein or, the, or in, one, in one case or the tau protein in another is injected into the vein of a person, and then they undergo a PET scan. And the PET scan can detect the small amount of radioactivity that binds to the amyloid or binds to the tau. Now, that, those tests are not available clinically for people if they're normal. They're available in clinical trials that are in which they're being tested. But in terms of if you're, just a, if you're a person and you wanted to simply know if you're developing those pathologies, you can't go to your doctor and say test them because um, they're, not a, they're not approved for that purpose at this point especially since we don't yet have an approved treatment to delay the disease. But they are being used very, very actively in research studies around the world, including at WashU, at many, many places all over the world, to really determine how useful they're going to be ultimately in, in diagnosing the pathology so that people can get treated. But, and, and you did and mention... Other, the other, I'm sorry, the other yeah. way to detect these pathologies is in the cerebrospinal fluid. So one can undergo yeah. a very straightforward, it's like drawing blood. A spinal, sounds bad, but a spinal tap's not that big of a deal. You can get the test to determine whether you have amyloid deposition and tau accumulation through a spinal tap. But again, we're not using that in normal people that come into the clinic. We're only doing that in research volunteers that are in studies at the moment. Right, and let's extend that a little bit. Uh, because, as you mentioned earlier in your talk, uh, one of the holy grails here is trying to find a simple biomarker in the blood or other body fluid that's easy to extract, early to extract, to identify those people who are at greater risk earlier to take advantage of that early intervention theory. So the question is, behind all of that, is how close are we, do you think, to some kind of blood-based biomarker? I think we're right on the verge of, of having that. I think within um, at one to two years, there will be valid, validated markers that will be useful to detect whether you have amyloid and or tau deposition. I'm very soon. Wow, that is really encouraging. Uh, next question up. We think of Alzheimer's as a memory disease, but it seems to be a full brain disease with memory loss as an early symptom. Is this true? Um, uh, yes, it is mostly correct. So, as the, so we th the, there's different types of dementing diseases. Let's just make it, to make it simple, two of the most co the common ones are Alzheimer's disease and, or frontotemporal dementia is another neurodegeneration. Alzheimer's disease tends to affect, over time, the, the back part of the brain, 
So it affects the, what's called the temporal lobes and the parietal lobes. And so people begin initially with memory loss, but then they also start getting trouble with problem solving, trouble with language, calculations, and that is full-blown dementia. But the front part of the brain isn't quite as impaired as people that have this other form of neurodegeneration where the first symptoms in frontotemporal dementia are with emotions, disinhibition, and not with memory. Hmm. But yes, Alzheimer's disease definitely affect, eventually affects most of the brain other than the, like the primary motor area and the primary sensory area. So usually until very end stage, people can still you know, move their arms and legs and, and walk. And only at the, at the end of the disease, yes, the whole brain gets affected. But it does tend to affect more the back part of the brain than the front part. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, next question is, is it possible that treatments targeting amyloid would also treat tau accumulation? Uh, I think that is very likely to be the case, uh, but we still don't know for sure. So uh, because, in, at least in Alzheimer's disease, there's evidence in animal models as well as in humans that the, the accumulation and spreading of tau in the brain is dependent on amyloid accumulation. So the idea would be if you block amyloid accumulation, you might then be able to slow down the tau spreading through the brain. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's, and so that's what, ult I think in order for that to happen, though, it's very likely you're going to have to block the amyloid cascade pretty early. Mm -hmm. once, mm -hmm. once tau starts spreading, it may be difficult to stop that just with blocking amyloid. Okay. That's how I think about it at this point, at least. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Uh, next one is, does reducing inflammation in the body also reduce inflammation in the brain? So um, we don't have the answer for that yet in humans, but there are some intriguing animal studies, including some being done by Cure Alzheimer's funded investigators, that suggest that um, there's areas of the, of the, in the body, such as in our, in our intestinal tract and the gut, that have a very active um, immune system, just like the rest part of our body. And if you modify the, what's called the microbiome or micro, gut microbiome, that modifies inflammation in the body and has been shown in animal models to affect inflammation in the brain. So um, I'd be surprised if the same thing doesn't happen in people, but what we don't know yet is how do we modify the gut microbiome or other aspects of inflammation in the body to most effectively affect brain inflammation. But, mm -hmm. but I think there is good evidence that there is some crosstalk that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go back. I want to interject one here um, about APOE, uh, which is such a fundamental gene in Alzheimer's disease. It, it uh, tends to be dominant among those who aren't uh, affected with familial, as I understand. Uh, that's correct. And, and not enough is known about that gene. And Dave, you're going to lead a consortium of, of researchers funded by Cure Alzheimer's Fund to look into this. Tell us a little bit more about this important gene and protein and why that's such a high priority. Oh, my gosh, it, it really is. And that, uh, so of the common form of Alzheimer's disease, the late onset form, by far the most important genetic risk factor is APOE. So if you have one cop, the, so the, the, one, the form of APOE that's associated with worse outcome is called APOE4. There's three common variants that occur in humans, APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. If you're unfortunate enough to have two copies of APOE4, your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease is 12 times higher than somebody that does not have APOE4. Um, and we know now that APOE is important in part because it influences amyloid deposition. And E4 is worse than that than E3 and E2. Um, but there's other things that APOE does in the brain that um, are not only involve amyloid deposition that, but also affect other processes. So one of the things in the, in the new consortium that we hope to do is to try to sort out not only does how not only how does APOE affect amyloid deposition, but what are the other processes that are going on, whether it be inflammation or tau accumulation or the actual neurodegeneration, how is it affecting that pro those processes? Because if we get a better handle on that, maybe we can actually turn APOE not just into a genetic risk factor, but a treatment target. Uh -huh. 
Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question is, because one could, can, excuse me, can one be tested for a TREM2 mutation? How would a mutation to this gene affect your risk compared to APOE? Right. There's not quite as much data yet in, but, but the data that's available suggests that if you have, um, everybody has two copies of each gene they have in their body. So APOE, there's two copies. TREM2, there's two copies. The mutations in TREM2 that are linked with increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, if you have a mutation one copy of TREM2, you're about two to four times more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. If you have, a muta if you have the APOE4 allele of APOE, and just in one copy of it, you're about four times higher, more likely to get Alzheimer's. So the TREM2 mutations that are linked with Alzheimer's disease appear to have about maybe slightly less, but a somewhat similar effect as one copy of APOE4. So it's a strong risk factor. The, the thing is that it's not quite as, it's very uncommon in the population. So I think it's something like 1% of people have one of these TREM2 mutations that put you at higher risk. APOE4, about 20 to 25% of the population has at least one copy of APOE4. So mm -hmm. just, yeah, that, hopefully okay. that gives a feel for it. Sure. How does aging trigger APOE4 to harm the brain? Yeah, so that's a great question. The, major, the most important risk factor for getting this disease is age, and in addition to genetics. We don't really know for sure. I mean, I can only speculate, and that um, is one of the things that we, thinks, that we think happens with aging is that the mechanisms that the brain uses to clear proteins doesn't work as well. Hmm. So clear, clearance is not as good. And one of the things that APOE has been shown to do is influence the clearance of amyloid protein. So one possibility is that with age, um, because APOE and age both affect clearance of proteins, maybe that's a connection. We don't, that's one possibility. Another one is that with aging, we also get more inflammation in the body and in the brain, and APOE has also been linked with altering the inflammatory response. So mm -hmm. those are two things. Actually, those are the kind of questions we hope to really nail down in the consortium. Great. Excellent. Uh, okay, here's another one. Uh, a person says, I heard there's a link between Alzheimer's and diabetes. Does one confer risk for the other, or does the arrow go both ways? The data that I'm aware about um, strongly argues the, the arrow probably goes more from diabetes to Alzheimer's disease. In other words, if you have diabetes, you're about two times more likely to get Alzheimer's disease than somebody who doesn't have diabetes. What's not answered yet, though, is whether, whether the effect of diabetes on increasing risk for dementia and Alzheimer's disease is due to the diabetes or high glucose and other changes in insulin, whether those are affecting the Alzheimer pathology directly or whether the diabetes is affecting, say, vascular damage to the brain. And then if you get Alzheimer pathology and vascular damage, then you're going to get be more likely. This is something mm -hmm. my lab's been working on as well as other labs. And I would say that it, it may be a combination of the two where, where, uh, that's acting here, but there needs to be a lot more work on that. Okay. Interesting. It's, there's, that link has been posited for a long time, and it's been very elusive to try to Absolutely. nail down. So, yeah. Uh, I think there are two more questions in the queue here. Uh, next one is, does the term neurodegeneration encompass all of Alzheimer's pathology? Well, yeah, so neurodegeneration really refers to the, um, the degeneration of a nerve cell so a nerve cell, 99% of a nerve cell is the nerve cell processes that communicate w between one cell and another. So the axons and the dendrites, and then there's the cell body. So neurodegeneration refers to the fact that nerve cells are breaking down. So neurodegeneration occurs in many different neurodegenerative diseases. It occurs in Alzheimer's disease when the cells that are affected are degenerating, but it also occurs after a stroke. It happens after Lou Gehrig's or ALS, but in different parts of the nervous system. It occurs in 
Lewy body dementia. So it occurs in many diseases. It just means that the nerve cells are breaking down. Okay. Uh, last question we have is, what happens to the aging brain to switch from normal functioning to Alzheimer's? What, what, what's going on there that messes things up? Yeah, I think, I think most of the evidence is that what I was talking about in the lecture is that we really feel that uh, there's two main things going on. There's proteins accumulating that shouldn't be. And those proteins, when they accumulate, are damaging nerve cells and their connections. And then on top of that, the, the proteins that accumulate are inducing an inflammatory response. So the combination of these proteins accumulating and the inflammatory response are damaging nerve cells. So we and, need to figure the, out better ways. Yeah. And the fact that, that one or more of these proteins are associated with the immune system means that this creates the cycle, right? Because it, it, things kick off and then the brain's trying to protect itself, but at the same time, it's exacerbating these things. Right, and we used to, I think most of us used to think years ago that there, we knew that there was an inflammatory response in Alzheimer's disease, but we thought it was just secondary, that cells were damaged and dying, and so there was an inflammatory response, but it was just reactive, but that it wasn't necessarily involved in causing the disease to progress. Mm -hmm. But if you, have a, if you have a gene mutation in a gene that's only expressed in the inflammatory cells, and then you develop and that, and that gene mutation causes the disease to be worse, that tells you that the inflammation is directly involved in the disease process. It's not just a reaction. Right. Okay. Well, David Holtzman, we've learned a lot today. Thank you very, very much. And even more importantly, thank you for your lifelong professional and personal commitment to solving this disease. We, we very, very much appreciate it. There are a lot of people out there working hard to help you do this job. So I want to also thank all the people who joined us for this first Catalyst Society webinar uh, and let you all know that we will be following up with you individually to get your opinions and your perspective on this experience and uh, not sure how we could make it better from Dave's perspective, but how we can do better from Cure Alzheimer's point of view. So thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. And Dave, thanks once again. Everybody will sign off. Have a great weekend.